Today I'm beginning a short series entitled, Being the Church of Jesus Christ in a Modern World. What does it mean for us to be the church of Jesus Christ today? In our world right now. How do we function? What are we supposed to be doing? What is it supposed to look like? What is it supposed to sound like? How, how are we supposed to do this thing called church? Especially being focused on Jesus Christ as church. Now, can you agree with me this morning that it is possible to have church without Jesus? I'm telling you, it's absolutely possible to do church without Jesus. And some people would think, well, that's not true. I'm telling you, it's possible. We are called the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is those who have been set free by Jesus. Those who have come face to face with Jesus Christ, met Jesus, Jesus has changed their life, changed their heart, changed their spirit, changed their soul. They have been taken from darkness and brought into light. They have been saved, sanctified, made holy, made pure through the Holy Spirit of God, and now are part of the church, the church that Revelation tells us that Jesus is going to be returning for his church, the people who are called by his name, who are living for Jesus. That's who we are supposed to be as a Christian church, a Bible-believing Christian Jesus Christ church. Now, do you believe me that you could still have, you could do church without Jesus? Because there are churches today in this country who are worshiping Allah and Jesus in the same service. Is that possible? That half of their service is a Muslim service and half of their service is a Christian service? Is that a church of Jesus Christ? We live in a culture that is commonly referred to. People can call themselves Christians and pretty much do as they wish. I'm going to speak to you this morning about what I believe are five competing gospels. Five competing gospels that we have. And especially in the United States of America, but I believe worldwide. And for us to really understand this idea of a competing gospel, we have to go all the way back to Genesis. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3. If you have your Bible, if your iPad, smartphone, whatever it is that you have, Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. It's not up on the screen, so don't put that up there yet. Because I wanted to read this to us this morning. I really want you to hear the words of this Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I really want you to hear these words. I want you to understand that this is the beginning of all creation. This is where God has created everything. This is the beginning of mankind. Chapter 3, Genesis. Chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis is all about what? Creation. At the end of chapter 2, God creates man, and then he says God said that man needed a helper, and God created woman. Whoa, man. That was what Adam said. Whoa, man. Come on now, that's funny. Golly. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent. Who is the serpent? 
was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. The serpent speaking again, You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. In the very beginning of creation, there has been competition between two entities, God and Satan. That competition is still alive. And will continue to be alive until the book of Revelation comes to full fruition. And immediately we see here, Satan provides for Adam and Eve a competing gospel. A competing gospel that is meant to do what? Distract, take away, confuse, steal, destroy, and kill. It was meant to simply take Adam and Eve out of the perfection of the relationship that they had with God in the garden and put them in an imperfect relationship with God. And it was deceptive, and it was manipulative, and it sounds really good. But in the end, it brought death. It took Adam and Eve, thus taking all of us out of the garden. And it was a competing gospel. I'm going to submit to you five competing gospels. And this is just five. I think there's probably multiple. Most of these gospels are going to be really closely related. They're going to sound alike. They're going to look alike. And they're also going to be very vague. The first one is simply the happy gospel. The happy gospel revolves around a statement that sounds something like this. I deserve. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to have all of my dreams fulfilled. I deserve happiness. Why am I not happy? The happy gospel is all about me feeling like or coming to the place of feeling like I deserve something better than what I have. And the thing that I deserve, this thing that I think I deserve, becomes the thing that I'm focused on, and if I will just get that thing, I will be happy. I will be happy. It will meet all of my stuff. It will meet my criteria. It will meet what I need to be happy. And if I will just get that thing or those things, I will be happy 
for the rest of my life. I will feel wonderful. I will feel great. I will feel fantastic. I will be happy. You know that never says anywhere in the Bible that God says we're supposed to be happy. God says we're supposed to have joy and peace. It doesn't say happy. Why do you think they call it happy hour? Because if they just consume enough of that stuff, they're going to get happy. Because suddenly all of their things begin to disappear. All of their life begins to fade into the background, and I'm just happy. We find ourselves desiring, wanting, feeling like we deserve things. Again, here's the thing. Does the Lord want us to be joyful? Does the Lord want us to have peace? See, the happy gospel is all about these things I deserve that's going to make me happy. But I get one, and what happens? I'm happy for about a day. Oh, well, I think I need, I think I just need, oh, I'll just, one more thing. I'll, oh, okay, I'm happy. Well, you know, brother over there, he's got, well, I think I want that. Well, that'll make me happy. Or, you know, my wife's not making me happier. Or my husband's not making me happy. I think I'll get me a new wife. New husband. That'll make me happy. That'll make me happy. I'll get me a new job. That'll make me happy. The happy gospel. Second one is the hyper grace gospel. The hyper grace gospel simply says, I desire. Now, there's a big difference between I deserve and I desire. And it plays out for us in our culture today. I desire simply is Christians who say, I desire to live in a certain way, and so the gospel needs to change to fit what I desire. Not me change to where the gospel is. Because I desire to live in a certain way, or I desire to, to, to have these things, or I desire, uh, especially I desire something that I know is not in accordance with the will of God, or in lining up with the scriptures. So I desire things that are not in line with the scriptures. And now the, hi the hi hyper grace gospel says, Jesus loves me, and he loves me, and he loves me, and he will always love me, and, and he does, somebody say he does, and he will never pass judgment on me because I want to live in this sinful way. I want to live in this sinful pattern. I want to continue to have this sinful thing. I desire to live like this. And so now the gospel has to change to satisfy me. The people who are involved in the hyper grace, see, they have taken the sovereignty of God and thrown it away. They have taken the holiness of God and pitched it out the window. They're not facing a true God. They've taken God and made their own image of God, and they've created their own God that is only going to love me all the time. And here's the deception. Jesus does love me all the time. Somebody say amen. Jesus absolutely loves me every day of every week, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days of the year. But if I'm in his church, he asks more of me than that. He asks me for my life. And my life begins to line up with his word and his truth. We are seeing this played out for us on our country every day, people. Oh, hear me. Hear me. You cannot live in complete rejection of the Word of God, no matter how much you want to, and still be a follower of Jesus.
You can't have Allah and Jesus in your church service at the same time. That's kind of idol worship. You can't live in inappropriate relationship and follow Jesus at the same time. You can't do that. The hyper grace gospel is being preached all over this world by very prominent, very famous people. It is clearly the thing that is distracting the church of Jesus Christ more than any other gospel right now. I'll tell you that. Absolutely. The third one is the smorgasbord gospel. Smorgasbord gospel simply says, I want. Can somebody please get me a bottle of water? I want. I want. And, it's, and we, we come to the church and we begin to look around the church. We begin to look around the ministries and we begin to, we begin to pick and choose. Well, it's, it's like I, Mary and I love to go to Ruby Tuesdays because they have the absolute best salad bar. Somebody say amen. And so we go to the salad bar. And, and every time Mary and I, we get our salad and my salad looks completely different than Mary's salad. <laughs> our vets are shocked about that, right? Mine has eggs and meat and all these things, and hers is just green. Boring. It's healthier, but it's boring. Come on now. She has light dressing, and I have the fattest one I can get. Come on now. Because that light dressing just doesn't taste very good. Well, we walk into the church, and we walk into following Jesus, and we lay out our smorgasbord. Not we, people. And we begin to pick and choose off of the smorgasbord. Well, I, I like that. I like that. I, I don't like that. Now, it might, it might completely line up with Scripture, but I, choose, I'm choose, I don't really like that. I don't really agree with that. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm going to skip by that one. I'm going to go to this other one over here that I like, that I want. I want. This is the gospel that church hoppers are involved in. Right here. Because their pastor is never going to be good enough for them. He's never going to say it right. He's never going to do it right. He's always going to have something that they're not going to like. They're going to prefer it some other way. And then they end up in another church, and that pastor can't do it either. Somebody say amen. I'm telling you, that pastor can't do it either. In fact, just so you know, there is no pastor that's going to satisfy the smorgasbord people. It's impossible. Because every week what they want is something different. And they very rarely want the gospel. They like to pick and choose what they believe, what they think how they feel, based upon what's being presented to them. They rarely, rarely are ever involved in this. It's all about them. And so they do all that stuff. We've been dealing with the church hopping gospel people, the smorgasbord gospel in our country for about 40 years. And they just bounce from one to one to one to one to one. And they never land. They never stay someplace. And when they leave, it's always about somebody else. Always. Well, that, that wasn't the way I, I wanted it. That wasn't the way I wanted it. That wasn't the way I liked it. The sad thing is they even begin to take Bible, the Bible scriptures, and they begin to pick and choose what they want to believe in the Bible too. And they get caught up get caught up. Now those three are really, really similar. Really similar. The last two this morning are a little bit different. The, third, the fourth one is the what about me gospel. The I need gospel. I want to be real clear here before I go any further. Agree with me this morning. 
There are times in every believer's life where we have need. Can we just all raise our hands and agree to that this morning? There's a, there's a time where all of us are, there's a place where we need to be ministered to. There's no doubt about that. That's life. Say, that, say with me, that's simply life. Life is not always easy. Life is hard. Life is hard for us as Christians. We have struggle times. We have difficult times. That's not what I'm talking about here this morning. I'm talking about the person who is constantly living there. That's really all they ever think about is me. The I need. I need. They're just flowing in that, that flow. It's, and the enemy's got them so focused on, so thinking only about themselves that they can't get out of it without help. It's this desire, this need. Most of it is centered, almost all of it is centered for these people on things that have happened for them in their past. Hurtful things, bad things, terrible things that have been spoken into them or said to them or they have been involved in or somehow been, it's, it's terrible, terrible things. But Jesus is all about freedom. And so when I bring Jesus in, all of that should begin to fade away. That may not all go away, and it may take some time for it to go away, but it should begin to fade away. The light of Jesus should begin to clear that darkness out, and there should eventually be nothing but light. And there should be a point for that person where they can stand up and they can say, I am free. Now, it may take some time. But oftentimes, the I need people, they just, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that work. They don't want to put in that time. And really what they're looking for is someone to fix it for them. And nobody can but Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can. I don't care how many years you've been following the Lord. I don't even care how many degrees you have. I don't care how much training you've had. I don't care if you've been doing ministry or whatever for 4,500 years. You can't change. Not one person can change another person. The only person that can change another person is themselves and God. And so the what about me gospel begins to pull people in. And it becomes like a, kind of like a vacuum. The last one is the I am right all the time gospel. Say that with me. I am right all the time. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing because you know you think that. The I am right all the time gospel. I am. The central core is I am. I am. I don't have to share very long on this. Just so you know, agree with me this morning. Nobody here is right all the time. Nobody here has ever been right all the time. Nobody here is ever going to be right all the time. Period. This is the gospel of pride. This is a gospel that begins to function for a person and they are so prideful. We are, I have, I've had, the reason I wore this this morning is, first of all, in honor of us sending our mission trip, but also because I wanted to use it as an illustration. This is a handmade uh, garment from Nigeria. Every stitch you see was hand-stitched. Mary and I went to Nigeria the first time. There was one overriding thing that I just felt like the Lord said to me over and over and over again. And as I was going through the streets and I was experiencing the church and I was experiencing the people, there was one thing that really I just, I was really just knocked down by. And it was the idea that really what we as Americans had, had, had somehow exported to Africa about Jesus Christ was the I am right all the time gospel. 
that somehow we as Americans have got it all figured out. And that we're right all the time. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something. I've traveled enough abroad to just so you know, most people don't like that about us. In fact, other cultures absolutely despise that about us. They don't like it at all. Because for them, it exudes pride. Pride. None of us are right all the time. And even if we are right, should hear me? Even if we are right, we can still be wrong because of our attitude of trying to present how right we are. And that, in essence, becomes wrong. Now, all of that tied together, those are five quick things I can tell you. I, I believe that there's probably many, many more, many, many other versions of what I would say competing gospels. There might be the, the sports gospel in America. There might be the entertainment gospel in America. There might be the free time gospel in America, what I do with my free time. Those are just a few more. All of these potentially are competing gospels. And there's some central cores to all of this, to all of this idea. To really help me bring that point through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a, I'm going to put it up on, but I'm going to read a quote for you this morning from one of, the, one of the more famous churches in America today that was actually quoted. You've probably maybe even seen this quote. Because it's been all over YouTube. It's been all over. And I, as, as I'm reading this to you, I want you to really listen to what's being said. Listen to what's being shared here. It goes something like this. I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey a God, we are not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that's what makes God happy. Amen. Does anybody see any problems with that statement? Does anybody know who, who that quote is from? Her name is Victoria Osteen. She is the wife of Joel Osteen. Anybody see any theological issues with that statement? Anybody see anything how that absolutely does not line up with the Bible? See, the problem here is, is that these Gospels all function in three things. One, realized eschatology. Realized eschatology is simply this. I get it all now. I don't have to wait for anything. I get it all now. I get all the benefits of all the benefits of God, all the benefits of everything right now, which is just not true. The other thing it deals in is what I call the spirit of relativism. Spirit of relativism is simply this. Truth is relative to only what I choose to believe or agree with. In other words, there is no foundation. There's no barometer. There's nothing that is absolute truth. Everything is relative to what I choose to believe in or agree with. Lastly, the central focus of this is simply what? I. Self. All of these competing gospels, Go back to the Genesis. What did Jesus, what, the, what the enemy say? You will be like 
God. And God knows that you'll be like God, and so that's why God doesn't want you to eat of that, because he hates you. And if you eat of that, and he knows, in other words, God's withholding from you, he doesn't want you to know all the facts. He doesn't want you to know all the truth. He's withholding from you because he knows you'll become like him, and he doesn't want you to become like him. Being the church of Jesus Christ in a modern world is not this. This is a false doctrine. This is a false gospel. This is a combination of the happy gospel, the hyper-grace gospel, the smorgasbord gospel, the what-about-me gospel, and the all, I know the all there is all the time gospel right here. This compares all, this brings all of them into one clear focus. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a church of Jesus Christ. So, in conclusion, I'm going to leave you this morning with scripture. And I'm going to read these scriptures for you. And I'm going to invite you to ask yourself, have I been involved in the happy gospel? Am I involved in the hyper-grace gospel? Am I happy to be in the smorgasbord gospel? Or the what-about-me gospel? Or I'm, all, I'm right all the time gospel? Am I involved in those things? Am I being deceived? Am I being pulled into things that I shouldn't be involved in? It, where is my focus? See, the, the crazy thing for us today, guys, is this. Within three hours today of me completing this message, this message will be on YouTube. You have access to so much stuff. There are fruit hanging off the tree all over the place. The question is, are you discerning the fruit? Are you looking at the fruit through the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you looking through the fruit through the gospels of this world? And which are you choosing to pluck and participate in? Which of those fruits are you choosing to eat? And is that fruit bringing you to the true life of following Jesus Christ? Or is it bringing you to death? John 14 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. John 13 says, I have not come to be served, but to serve. Matthew chapter 5 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. John chapter 3 says, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. John chapter 19 says he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Chapter 20 says they laid him there. At the end of chapter 20 it says he saw and he believed. Later on at the end of chapter 20 it says they saw the Lord. Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. Romans 8, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Luke chapter 9, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily follow me. I invite you to bow your heads. Our worship theme is coming. In this stark comparison this morning between the gospels of this world and the gospel of Jesus Christ, where do you find yourself? Where do you find yourself? As the subtleties and the manipulation and the deception of the, of the serpent snuck its way into your life? Do you find yourself further engaged in those things than you even realize? Maybe you're here this morning and this presentation has somehow sparked in you an understanding that you need Jesus. You need Jesus. In fact, maybe the only gospels you've ever had in your whole life has been the, the enemy's gospel. And today you want the real gospel. If that is you, know that Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of all, willingly died upon a cross for you, gave his life for you, shed his blood for you. He willingly let himself be killed. They put him in a tomb, and on the third day he rose again in glory, victorious over sin, death, and hell, victorious over the gospels of our enemy, the one true gospel. And if you want to live, really live, if you want to be in the church of Jesus Christ, you must accept Jesus. So today maybe is your day to accept Jesus. If that's you, there will be people over here when the music begins to accept Jesus and to rededicate your life to him. See, the central focus of the true gospel is not I. It's not me. It's Jesus. Jesus. Where do you find yourself standing today? The wonderful thing about Jesus is this. He does have real grace for us. When we receive revelation, if we will repent, turn from those things, follow him, he offers forgiveness. Freely offers forgiveness. And then we begin to live in a different place. I invite you to stand. Raise your hands to the Lord this morning. As the music begins, receive this. In Jesus' name, I pray that you would just open your heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the true gospel, that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you those areas where you need him to reveal, that you would have the courage this morning to respond to Jesus Christ, to live out the real gospel of Jesus, not these other gospels. That, I, that you would simply do as you need to do today according to the Holy Spirit, whether that is repent, whether that is needing prayer, that you would respond to Jesus and that he would do something amazing in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.